exclusions. School exclusions. Well, it ain't going to be exclusion from life, is it? talk about what we're here for today which of course is exclusions and this piece we're not scripting this piece this is going to be a random chat we've got a few bullet points that we're going to kind of go through so to kind of keep ourselves in line but we're not going to script it to start with ab tell me what is an exclusion in education <laughs> okay, so an exclusion in education is the, it's the official terminology used when a child is told not to attend school for a specific reason. So that could be a fixed term exclusion, which back in the day we used to call a suspension. Um, or it could be a permanent exclusion, which we used to call expulsion. Um, and they are that's quite specific terminology that's set by the dfe department for education it's in their exclusions guidance exclusions for school um, and that is available on the dfe website or if you want a printed version it's on my amazon site and it talks about the things that you can exclude children for what are the reasons that you can be excluded Okay, so it's an interesting one in that you can only exclude a child for something in your behaviour policy. So if you have um, put in there that you're going to exclude students for persistent behaviour, then you can exclude the child for persistent behaviour. But if you actually haven't included that in there, then you shouldn't be excluding them for it. There are a number of categories that we usually find um, them sitting under there are actually 12 categories which i will read physical assault against a pupil physical assault against an adult bullying all types verbal abuse and threatening behavior against a pupil and repeated against an adult racist abuse which is separate from bullying sexual misconduct drugs and alcohol related damage and that's willful damage theft Persistent disruptive behaviour, which is, I'll come back to because from an SEM perspective, I don't think any child should ever be excluded on that basis because I do believe that that's an indicator of SEM. Mm -hmm. um, and then, we, ironically, we have a category called other, which apparently can include incidents that are not covered by the other categories but should be used sparingly. For example, we have just done a video about isolation booths. Mm -hmm. When you are taking a child out and putting them into isolation, effectively you are excluding them from their entitlement yep. to access their education. Yep. Um, and this is where a, a lot of conversation comes about, about is that uh, appropriate? Um, and it, we, we've got a whole video about where that may or may not be a suitable exactly. solution. We're not going to go into that again now. Protected characteristics and exclusions. How do they go together? <laughs> okay, so, gosh, that's really hard. Um, there's a bit of a perception sometimes that you can't exclude a child with an EHCP, Education Health Care Plan. And whilst that's true to a certain extent, that child is still subject to the school's behaviour policy. Mm -hmm. However, that school must be putting into place reasonable adjustments to their behaviour policy. That's, students with an EHCP are 1.4% of the population. My brain's just gone out. I have got a headache today, by the way. So if I'm wrong on that percentage, I apologise. Um, we've got 1.4% with an EHCP plan, an education health care plan. We cocoon them a little bit mm -hmm. because we have to make sure we are meeting their needs. And if we are doing everything that is in Section F of an education health care plan, there should be no need to exclude that child. However, our child comes in, they set fire to the classroom, they've got an education health care plan for cognition and learning needs and... Um, they have support in lessons for their reading and writing. Their action of setting fire to the classroom is totally unrelated to their special educational need um, and is totally unpredictable. It would be reasonable to exclude that child for that offence. 
So from an education healthcare plan perspective, yes, you can um, fixed term exclude the child where appropriate. Where the problem arises is if you wanted to permanently exclude that child because the school is named on that plan. And to permanently exclude that child would require um, the whole process around naming a uh, educational establishment to be redone. So what you would be expected to do is call an early annual review. You are expected to try to avoid that exclusion if you can. But if that's not possible, you it is you are still allowed to permanently exclude a child with an education health care plan. It's just not <laughs> it's frowned upon. It's it's not really what we want and it's not necessarily in everybody's best interests. Mm. Okay. okay. And the other side to that is when we are talking about protective characteristics, as you said. Yep. So I always use the example of a child with Tourette's. So we know that Tourette's does not necessarily mean that they swear all of the time, but let's just imagine that we have a child who uses bad language. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they, uh, if a child comes into your classroom, just Fred Bloggs comes into your classroom and starts using the F's and the C's and the B's and the D's and all the rest of it. He's now trying to work out what words they are. Um, <laughs> if they start coming in and doing that, normal Fred Bloggs, then your policy may say that you can exclude the child for that. Mm. However, a child with Tourette's who is known for their swearing outbursts, or their tics, they are called tics, you cannot exclude them for that because that is their protected characteristic. It is a part of their behaviour associated with their special educational need. Just the same as a child with nystagmus, which is wobbly eye syndrome, their eyes wobble from side to side, you wouldn't scream at them, keep your eyes still! Best teacher voice coming out there. Um, you wouldn't say that to them it's not a reasonable expectation and it would not be a reasonable expectation to expect a child with Tourette's to not swear mm. when they've got a tick coming on it's very hard to hold ticks in okay. and I can guess that you're probably going to ask me about ADHD of course I am of course he is. <laughs> so ADHD, again, very, very similar. If we know a child has a diagnosis of ADHD or we suspect that they have ADHD, and that's also quite important, you do not need to have a diagnosis of a special education It's the need. old crystal ball and the foreseeable. It We've is. We've talked about that before. <laughs> it is. So they don't need to have a diagnosis. If Even if you suspect it, you have to put in the reasonable adjustments for it. And if you know that that they are going to get up and walk around the classroom no matter how much you might find that disruptive if it is a part of their characteristic and their behavior mm. then you can't exclude them for it it's unfair it's unreasonable they can't control it it, it, it is sticky ground it is difficult and it is judgment call a lot of the time and a, a lot of exclusions that I, I end up hearing about and I end up supporting people with, a lot of it is around not understanding that child fully and thinking they are willfully doing, doing this as opposed to this is their special educational need that is driving them to do this. That they have no control over as such until they learn some kind of cognitive behavior yeah because what so. happens is they'll say well they be, they can behave for such and such or they, they they behaved this morning or they 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 did that then why can't they do it now and just because you can do it at one time doesn't mean you can do it at another time the, the analogy that's very often used is a bottle of coke mm. And, you know, you can give it a little shake and it's okay. And you can give it a big shake and it's it's kind of okay. And then you give it a massive shake and it, it explodes everywhere. You don't know how much of what is going on around somebody they are bottling up yep. until that cap explodes. Exactly. And I said in one of my videos, I have sat on an exclusions panel this morning and we have permanently excluded a child for persistent disruptive behaviour on the back of an extremely violent assault on another student and my SEN heart even, not even my hat, 
was sat there going, mm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this because persistent disruption to mm. me means you're not meeting their needs. Yeah. However, for this particular child and the, the, the violence that they exhibited, it was absolutely the right thing to do to get them what they needed, the next steps and the next access. And this was from an alternative provision. This wasn't from a school, it was from an alternative provision. So he'd already had a massive package of support mm. and we know that all of those things were being met. But, but it still just, wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough and needed more. Yeah. And that just wasn't within the hands of the school the AP to provide that. So you then pass it on to somebody who is more capable of actually handling that, hopefully. Well, yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, I, I find it difficult because you're passing them into the hands of the local authority. First five days, the school has to provide the education. So it's usually a work pack. Let's face it, it never gets done. Or it might be a log on to Ed Lounge or an online package. Again, very rarely gets done. Um, and then the, your local authority picks it up from day six with a permanent exclusion. But unless that local authority can find an appropriate place to put that child, it's very, very difficult. So it's highly unlikely they're going to go straight into another school. Mm -hmm. And if they were, then you'd probably be arranging a managed move rather than a permanent exclusion anyway, because that would be uh, your way of avoiding a permanent exclusion. And schools do try to avoid permanent exclusions. So that's not likely to happen. You could put them in a pupil referral unit, mm -hmm. but those spaces are few and far between. And generally speaking, local authorities don't have many of them available. So a, a large county like ours, yeah. kids would probably have to travel 30, 35 miles. And parents very often are responsible for transporting and they can't do it. Now, I remember somewhere, and you're probably going to tell me that I'm completely wrong. Probably. Somewhere. I'm sure they were excluded and they had been offered a place somewhere and the parent refused for that school to that student to go to. It's fine. It's, it's, it, without knowing the full story, it's quite difficult to answer. If they've been offered it as a managed move, mm -hmm. the parent can refuse the managed move and the child would then probably go to a permanent exclusion. Yeah. At which point they become the responsibility of the local right. authority and the local authority yep. is supposed to find them an alternative place to go to. If they had been permanently excluded and the local authority has found them uh, an establishment to go to, yep. which in this case would probably be the PRU, yep. the parent again can refuse to have them attend the PRU. And the local authority is under no obligation to provide an alternative to mm -hmm. that. But then the local authority can fine the parent for the child not attending the pro. And that's why it turns so, into home education because yeah, the, so parent the parent doesn't want will, to be fine. The parent doesn't want to be fine, so they will then sign the paperwork and say, actually, I'll go for elective home education. And the, the big problem for parents is once they've kind of gone down that route of, oh my God, bury my head in the sand, I don't want to tackle this one, and mm -hmm. they sign that paperwork that says elective home education, it's actually quite hard to get back into And I think that was schools. what the problem that they had. They could not get themselves back into a school yeah. once they had gone through that. But... To be fair, they can go through a normal application process, um, and if a school has spaces, it, sh it cannot or should not be turning mm. that child away. Um, what usually happens though is that that school will see on the application form that they were permanently excluded from school X, yep. then the parent electively home educated, now they want to come back into school. Well, what the school will be looking at is what on earth has been happening while they've been on that elective home education to change their behaviour. And we know from experience as you know, education professionals that generally speaking nothing has been happening there to address it and being at home we know that boundaries are not necessarily always there yep. so it's, it's very very difficult for a school to then turn around and go oh yeah we'll have them in year 10 come on bring it on it makes it tricky for them yes and i'm not saying that's right but it, it, it is tricky we've had the conversation before um, and I'm going to go slightly off subject here. The needs of that one student are actually greater or, than the rest of the class that they go into yeah. on those kind of basis. So that student might want to come back, in, come in, and they have the right to come in because they have to be educated all the way up to to 18, as it is now. It is 18. And you can't stop that from happening. But the question I've asked before is simply, 
what happens to the education of those other people should the school not be looking after the, the education of the rest of the people in that class and thinking of them first because there's 30 odd of them in that class because it's a really crap class and those 30 students should have the right to kind of have a decent education without being interrupted by this one student who wants to come in, who's been pulled out, who's then had elective home education. Where's their rights in all this? Yeah, it's really, really hard because everybody has rights. Mm. You know, you've got your, your 29, 30 kids who are already there, they're already established, they're already working, and we've got the one who wants to come in, who may well come in and, and integrate and be absolutely fine, or may well come in and have no idea how to interact with 30 other individuals, how to behave in a classroom, um, that they, they were permanently excluded for a reason, they may be bringing that reason back in, they may not have the knowledge that they have, but it's not a special educational need at that point, no. because it's actually lack of education, and we need to be very clear on that, that not having had an education is not a special educational need need ironically because you couldn't categorize that underneath cognition and learn they have the ability to um cognate and learn but they just have missing have skills yeah. yeah so it's very very difficult because everybody has their rights mm. um but if a school says yes we'll take you on roll then the school has got to manage that okay. and how they decide to manage that is up to them an american system you would probably put them in a younger year group. Right. So you could hold fill those gaps, hold them back a year, put them back two years even. The UK system does allow you to do that, but it very often isn't used. And is it right? Is it can be, it can't be. They don't necessarily have a peer group, so they're not necessarily going back to the same group of peers. So you can't use the argument that they're not moving up with their, their mm. friends. And it might be appropriate to put them in a different year group. Okay. But. Okay, so going back to the exclusion. Yes, now, let's go back to exclusions. We've just, we've just gone completely off my bullet points that are on that slide up there. As up we there. do. The next part of our bullet points is simply, who can exclude? Okay, so the only person in a school that has the right to exclude a child is the head teacher, or in the absence of the head teacher, their designated deputy. Okay. Okay, and I wrote about this in my book which I'm going to flash back flash up again. again. It's actually okay. on discount at the moment. It's well, actually, while we're recording this, it's on discount. It might not be for very much longer because we're going to put the price back up at some point because it's on sale. I wrote about who can and who can't exclude. Now, I've worked in schools where, I keep saying that phrase, I've worked in schools where it could be the head of year who delivers the message to parents that that child has been excluded. I've been asked to deliver the message to parents that their child is being excluded. But it, it is not my decision. I, I am not allowed no matter how much I might want to think I've got that power, I cannot make that decision. That solely lies with the head teacher or in their absence, their designated deputy responsibility. That's fine. So that's what the law says on that. Absolutely. There. What factors must be taken into account when you're going to exclude a child? <laughs> when you decide to exclude a child from school, we we do it on balance of probabilities. It's, it's, it's different to a court of law. On the balance of probabilities, did that child graffiti all over the desk? They're the ones sat there with a big black marker pen in their hand and the only one that's been sat at that desk and it's a brand new desk. There's graffiti all over it. Yes, it's it's on the balance of probabilities, it's likely to have been that child that graffitied over that desk. Right, so we're talking civil law. Yeah. So it's not, we, we talk about balance of probabilities, yeah. in criminal law you talk about beyond all reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the balance of probabilities, is this person, uh, has this person done or responsible for whatever it is we're trying to exclude for? Okay. okay. Do we have to consider, are there any mitigating factors? Absolutely, yes. So special educational needs come straight in there. Okay, so we need to take into account any special educational needs, obviously. To whether or not they may have impacted on that child's behaviour. You may also need to take into, a fact, into account anything like 
bereavement in the family the day before or mm. whether the dog got run over this morning or is it the anniversary of grandma's funeral or something like that so we we have mitigating factors that we have to take into consideration when you are issuing an exclusion now sometimes the school might not have all of that information at the point it makes that decision but on the balance of probabilities they are looking at did the child do the graffiti on the desk or whatever it was when you hit a certain number of days of exclusion or if it's a permanent exclusion you have to call a governor's panel and the governors will ask for reports and everything and at that point mitigating factors might actually come out right, okay. unfortunately we do know that sometimes a child will get an exclusion and it isn't until they come back into school and start talking to you that you realize that you know grandma passed away the day before it happened and nobody had told you mm. um, and, and that's unfortunate but we we do know that that happens who needs to be informed about an exclusion so we've said we've said governing body have you just said that? Um, we've said, well, I assume we've said the parent at some point in, in this <laughs> long exclusion video, but who okay. else? So, um, parents must be informed immediately. Yes, so, um, that has to be in writing. Um, usually, it's given to you as you pick the child up from when they've been excluded. That's the point at which you inform parents. That must be done. That's the, a legal requirement. If it is a permanent exclusion, then you must inform your local authority. Well, after five days, they become responsible for that child. In most schools, you would also inform your governors. I'm a chair of governors, and as soon as there is an exclusion, whether that is fixed term or permanent, I get notification. I don't get any information because I may have to sit on a panel at some point, but I am notified that there has been an exclusion. And I might ask a question around, is there anything I need to be aware of, yeah. but without digging into it. Yeah. And then, of course, if that is a permanent exclusion, there will be a panel, or if that child has hit 15 days in a term, we have to automatically convene a panel. So that's an independent review panel? No. Ah, so an independent review panel is something different to what it you're is. talking about. So, um, it's my next bullet point, that's okay. the reason why I mentioned it. That's okay. So a governing body exclusions panel yeah. is called after 15 days within a term or a permanent exclusion. Okay. We, at that point, we are not investigating what happened. We are purely checking, has the school followed its procedure, policy and practice? and were there any mitigating circumstances that they should have taken into account. Right. So we can decide to uphold that decision, or we can tell the school that, okay, no, come on, get a grip, put them back on roll, okay, or overturn a decision kind of thing. If we decide to uphold the school's decision, let's say for a permanent exclusion, because it just makes life easier, we decide to uphold that decision for them. In other words, we are supporting the school and saying, yes, you've done everything you possibly could the parents still have the right to appeal that. And they have two recourses for that. They can either go to first tier tribunal because yeah. they feel that we have discriminated against special educational needs and disabilities, mm -hmm. or they can take it to an independent review panel. And an independent review panel is pretty much the same thing, but it's looking at the governor body process of reviewing that exclusion right. so in other words did the governors follow policy procedure and right, practice okay. or did we break the rules by finding out information from the head teacher before yeah. the actual meeting or you we weren't impartial or um you know perhaps somebody that was on that panel that had a child in the same class mm -hmm who was affected by the particular child that's been excluded. At that point, you would actually say that that panel's not appropriate, but if you hadn't and they'd then upheld that decision, that would be a good one to take to an IRP. And the IRP, uh, Independent Review Panel, could again recommend uphold the decision. Yeah. They can go say to the school, actually, we recommend you revisit this one. And the school at that point has two choices. They either reinstate the child or they can uh, refuse to reinstate the child, but there are repercussions for that. Okay. The next part of it is simply, can the child or young person be reinstated? Well, we've talked about some of that already. 
Um, and some of that, well, I think we've talked about all of it, to be honest. Uh, so the governing panel can reinstate it, but actually at any point, be, uh, this is a permanent exclusion, at any point between the exclusion and the panel meeting, the school can change its mind. Right, OK. So let's say, for example, grandma's death came to light and they go, ah, actually, so there were mitigating circumstances. They could turn around and say, do you know what, we'll overturn it, they can come back. Or maybe they might turn around and go, you know what, we've found a managed move for you, would you like to go and try this? What happens after an exclusion? I think we've covered that as well. <laughs> yep, so from day six they become... Oh, and again, we're talking permanent exclusion. Yep, sorry. <laughs> we've got to make that clear. My, my bullet points on this thing should have said permanent exclusion all <laughs> the way through it, because then I wouldn't have had the, <laughs> the comments. After an exclusion, so from day six becomes the local authority's responsibility, mm -hmm. Um, it does not mean the child is written off. Yes, they can go back into a school. You know, sometimes we have one-off offences. I can think of a young man I dealt with last year um, up in Northumbria somewhere um, who, he, he it was a one-off incident. Uh, the school decided to permanently exclude. The mum tried to stop that from happening. That It didn't happen. They, they, they felt they couldn't meet the need anymore. The, the relationships had completely broken down. So they accepted the permanent exclusion. But what she did was she went and visited another school, explained it to them. He did have special educational needs. I just need to add that in there. Um, went and explained it to them. And that school said, you know what? Fine, we'll give him a chance. So before he even hit the local authority radar, they'd already agreed, yes, you yeah. can start here. So he does have a permanent exclusion that sits on his record, but actually he didn't miss any education. He started there and he's doing brilliantly. Okay. So it's not the end of the line for every child, even though it's quite an extreme solution to a problem sometimes. Okay. You can buy Av's book. Um, leave comments in the section below um, just if you have anything else to, to add to it or if you want her to answer anything. I won't answer anything because I don't know that much about it. Um, He'll just make funny comments. I'll just make the amusing comments because all I'm here to do is to get more viewers, to get more subscribers and so that we can help more schools out because that's what we're doing. So remember that the more views that we get, the more hours that we put in, the more profit that this makes, the more we will give back to schools because that's the intention of this. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.